not just in Calais, but also in uh, uh, Macedonia on the border with, uh, with Greece. We have a horrendous situation where literally uh, thousands and thousands of people are uh, now being prevented from travelling north uh, in, into Europe. Um, the European Union seems to want to turn Greece into a, a big camp for dumping refugees. Um, uh, the, the Greek authorities are now talking about not allowing people to move on from the, the, the Greek islands. All the different European states are falling out of, uh, uh, among themselves. But what they all have in common, I think, is a total dishumanity, uh, a lack of humanity towards people, the most, some of the most desperate people in this world, uh, who they're treating like, uh, like animals. Great to be here this evening, and big thank you to all the organisers for having Gay Stand Up to Racism. And I also wanted to thank Wayman because he also helped to organise the September 14th um, day where we went down to outside Parliament on a Saturday. It happened to coincide with Jeremy's election, um, but it was a great feeling, and there were lots of people from Hornsey and Wood Green there who really wanted to support. Um, refugees at that point and wanted to really make a statement by crowding out um, outside Parliament, Parliament Square, um, and it just happened to be a happy coincidence of, of Jeremy's election and the sun was shining and it was just a great <coughs> day to be on that platform and to look at, was anyone there who's yep. here tonight? Yeah. And it was just this great feeling of everybody pulling together and wanting to put on record their commitment to a more socially just a place and a place where everyone is welcome. Um, it's interesting as a new member of parliament because you really do realise um, how much more difficult it is for ethnic minority members of parliament um, and just how difficult it is to really get into, get elected and get into, um, you know, so the sorts of positions that MPs and councillors and so on are in. And I just wanted to sort of do a shout out, I know this isn't directly relevant, but just to the Operation Black Vote which is a great organisation, particularly I see some younger faces here who might one day be interested in being involved in politics because it is really important that we've got people coming through um, and who are active politically because um, Operation Black Vote does advise people on how to get into politics and how to become involved. The other thing I just wanted to say which isn't directly on this was just how I've been watching the coverage of the London elections coming up in the last few weeks. So I think Sadiq Khan's getting quite a hard time. I don't know if anyone else has noticed that, but um, so it kind of makes me want to go and deliver some more leaflets um, and knock on some more doors and make sure that he gets elected as our next mayor. Um, so let's talk a bit about refugees. There's been a lot happening in Parliament. We've had two special debates called um, by uh, Yvette Cooper, who is um, Labour's lead on refugees. Um, we also had a meeting of 250 people that the Labour Party held in Fortis Green. That was just one of our wards. Um, and it was great to see this response to that. Just people who are in the community, um, mainly from sort of just really within walking distance, like tonight, just coming, wanting to talk about how we can create um, a more diverse and a fairer place. Um, and we had a number of faith groups there, the synagogue, mosques, as tonight. Lovely to have Bibi with us here tonight. Well, you're going to say a few words in a minute, I'm sure. Um, but it is really important that faith communities, councillors, MPs really pull together at, these in, at this really difficult time. We do have to actually dig deep at these times and we have to push ourselves because there is an incredible tradition, particularly in North London, but across London, um, of reaching out to people of different faiths, backgrounds, colours, everything, um, and all joining together at really difficult times. Um, Calais has been talked about tonight already. I just want to put on record um, how pleased I am that uh, there's been a number of uh, Labour contingents who've been to Calais, including the leader of the Labour Party, to see what's happening there. And I'm very distressed to hear from my own constituents who have written to me who are volunteering there of tear gas being used, um, of you know riot outfits and so on. Um, and I think it's really, really important that our government does much more to work with France to create proper living conditions for people while their claims are being looked at. Um, it's a real disgrace that in the fourth most wealthy nation that that sort of thing is happening so close to us. Um, the Big Green Bookshop, I'm sure many of you buy books at the Big Green Bookshop in Wood Green. They had a contingent go over with a bus. They just um, hired a bus in the summer and all went with blankets, books, food, um, and just, I thought that was, a, once again, a great way of Haringey community just reaching out to people in need. Um, 
the march on the 19th, yes, we must be there. Um, and we must also continue to put this on record in the UK Parliament. Um, in the debate last week, which um, Yvette Cooper brought to Parliament, uh, we learned of the plight of unaccompanied minors. And this is something which is quite close to my heart. During the Kosovan crisis in 1998, I worked for Barnet Council, visiting unaccompanied asylum seekers from Albania, Kosovo, and all that region. Um, and we know that 10,000 unaccompanied minors have been lost or displaced from their family lost. groupings. Claimed loss. Claimed loss. Well, we don't know exactly, but um, what we can guess is that they're very, very vulnerable. Um, and we know that human trafficking is a massive problem. We know that there are big cities with prostitution possibilities and all the rest of it. And I think that's something which, once again, we've been asking the government to take a lead because we have some wonderful examples of resettlement for unaccompanied minors. Um, you know, many young people um, in our London schools were unaccompanied minors um, or in our colleges. Um, and that's something which we can really, we've got a track record on that and we should be much more proactive on it. Um, we've really tried to press the government on unaccompanied minors um, and disabled people in particular because that's two strengths that we have and we know that we can do a lot on that. But to date, we haven't had an overwhelming response. Um, but it really helps me, for those of you who are Horns in Wood Green constituents, please continue to write to me, keep telling me to keep up this because every few months I get another sort of set of emails saying that, but it's really, really important that Labour MPs put on the House of Commons on the floor and have these debates and highlight and put more pressure on the government to do much, much more. I'm going to leave it there because we've got a lot of speakers. I just also want to say how exciting it is to be on a platform with Gary Young. Because <laughs> I've been reading his articles like forever. <laughs> so it's lovely to be with you. I'm going to get a selfie later. <laughs> Thanks. As well, from the Whiteman Road Mosque, people all know the mosque quite well. Um, we'll speak next. And um, people don't know, um, that role was denied entry to the to the United States. Um, it will talk a little about that and the general issue of Islamophobia uh, in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's not very often, Gary, you see an MP blush. <laughs> Catherine actually blushed as she looked at you. Something special going on. Uh, I, I, had to, I had to say that, Catherine. I'm sorry. I saw it. So. Anyway, <laughs> good evening, everyone. Actually, good evening, refugees, I was about to say. Um, we are all refugees, actually, sons, daughters of refugees. I'm actually very proud of being a refugee, very proud of uh, God giving me a space on this earth as a refuge, and I'm very grateful for that opportunity and space. I'm not arrogant about my position. I know where I belong, and I think we should all remember our roots, and we should all remember where we come and where we will go. It is this earth that we'll all go into and decay and decompose and there'll be nothing left of us. So when people say, when people say we, we are not refugees and they discriminate you and me, when they look at our colours, when they look at our religion and when they say things against us, it makes you wonder what planet do they come from? Which planet do they come from? And where do they really live? Think about this, Mr. Mr. Trump, right? Uh, a son of a refugee, actually, grandson of a refugee. Yep. German grandfather came to America looking for work and he, he did okay, right? And then he <laughs> ran away because he couldn't pay taxes. And he was extradited back to Germany. And it's the wealth of his grandfather who then bought estates upon estates of the <coughs> destroyed American cities where there was no wealth, nothing. Poverty stricken, very terrible state of affairs. That's the wealth he inherited, and he's now a multi-billionaire, wanting to close off America from the refugees. Put up a wall he wants to do against the Mexicans, his policy of barring the Muslims from going to America. Isn't that just ridiculous? How stupid can you be? There are, what, seven million Muslims in America? What's he going to do with them? <laughs> Send them all to Guantanamo Bay? Come on, Cuba won't be able to take them all. It's a small little island. Really sad and terrible development in the world. When I was traveling, to America only recently, on the 20th, on 17th of December. I arrived at the airport, did everything as normally do, you do, went through the scanning, went through my, everything. I arrived at the gates, about to board. Somebody came and said, hello, yes, hi. 
Usually, as soon as they put my passport through the scanner, red light simply flashes. <laughs> so I'm taken to the other side for a secondary, they call secondary screening, whatever that means. It's random, by the way. So they ask me some questions, they take my bag, and then they say to me, please, on board have a good flight, usually. I've been to America so many times, so I'm quite used to it. But this time, somebody else came. I thought maybe I'm getting very VIP treatment. So he said to me, can I talk to you? I said, sure. He took my passport, he looked at my passport, looked at me, looked at my passport, looked at me, as if he hasn't seen me before. Sure, of course he hasn't. Uh, he just wants to make sure it's me. And then he says to me, uh, are you going to America? I couldn't stop laughing. I said, this is the only flight going to America from this gate. Anyway, he said, uh, I'm afraid you can't travel on this uh, plane. Your visa has been revoked. When I said to him, why? He said, because um, I'm only a messenger. I can't really give you an answer. You should get in touch with the American embassy. I said, okay. When I insisted on an answer, he said, maybe you've done something wrong and just walked off. <laughs> so I, then I have lots of friends in the media world. I tweeted one of them saying, hey, just revoked my visa. I couldn't get on the plane. It was Eddie Nestor from... Uh, BBC London, he called me up, he goes to me, Aspal, we must do an interview right now. I'm still at the airport. Go ahead, do the interview. But before I could leave, already uh, media persons have called up embassy and the story has already gone out. I received a phone call next morning inviting me to go to the embassy. Please come, we want to sort things out. Sort what out? We want to talk to you. We want to fix things. So I go to the embassy on Friday on Monday morning and then they take me to this underground bunker type of basement room three men sitting there with their arms folded didn't even introduce themselves please sit down tell us about uh, you and about your story what story i haven't done anything wrong well tell us about your side of the story well i don't have a side of the story you revoked my visa you tell me why you've invited me and why have you revoked my visa they had no answer eventually one of them says maybe there is somebody we don't like on your facebook group <laughs> what? I said to him, do you know how many people follow me? No. 30,000 people are on my Facebook like page. How am I supposed to know all of them? In fact, I hardly know any of them. Then I said, by the same logic, I follow Barack Obama. He looked at me and goes to me, do you? I said, yeah. So you haven't done your homework. Anyway, after a lot lengthy conversations with them, they said to me, well, we will investigate further. We may come back to you, we may not come back to you. The only way you can find out is by applying again. I said to him, I'm not that desperate, thank you very much. You took my visa, you give me my visa back when you want. That's only when I'm going to America, otherwise I'm not interested. I came home. I received an email from the embassy asking me to apply again. That means I have to pay £155 again, go through the whole process, and I, be, I may be denied my um, uh, visa. But ladies and gentlemen, you'd be absolutely surprised. I didn't get a visa because I wanted to. I was refused in Esther. And they asked me to apply for a visa. They gave me a B visa, B1 and B2 visa, that was valid for 10 years. It expires in 2024, when I was traveling. And yet they revoked it on the day I was traveling. Shame, shame, and big shame for America and its administration. That is Islamophobia at its best, and we hate it with vengeance, and we must stand together against it, no matter where it happens and to who it happens. We grew up in the east end of London facing racism, and that was bad. In a bottle thrown at our face, car windows broken, my dad's house, every other day the front window would get broken, doors kicked. It was hell on earth. We grew up in that environment in the east end of London. We thought in the 90s we could relax and really breathe, but now being a Muslim is a crime. And ladies and gentlemen, if we stay silent about it, it's going to get worse. What we are seeing today is only stopped. When the world stays silent against the Nazi atrocities that was perpetrated against the Jewish people in Europe, it's the silence of the world that allowed the Nazis to get away with it for as long as they did. It's only when they came together they were able to defeat, but they could have come together long before. On Wednesday, I was having dinner with a friend. My phone rang at 10.30. Hi, we're from the Evening Standard. Yes, what can I do for you? It's a bit late to call me. Oh, we're running a story about Sadiq Khan. I said, and? Oh, it's going to be quite dangerously... Um, it was not going to be a good story. Um, Michael Fallon has talked about him in, in a very nasty way, <coughs> and we're running that story. What do you have to say about him? What do you want me to say about him? And the uh, implication was... I'm a Muslim, a cleric. They want to make a connection. Sadiq Khan is an MP who is Muslim by religion. 
So a cleric who knows Sadiqan, there is a connection. He's just a candidate for the Muslims and then label him as an extremist. That's what they want to do, right? So I said to these guys, calling Sadiq Khan an extremist is like calling Daesh moderate. Are you mad? Have you lost your top? I actually said it. I said, quote me, tell Michael Fallon to walk to Dover Cliffs and take a hike. I said, he said quote me, for if he speaks in, a, such a, in such a nasty manner to a man who is doing his best, he comes from an ordinary background, he tried his best, and he's done so well, and we're very proud of him. Is it wrong to be a Muslim? We are stuck between rock and a hard place. If you're not engaged, you're not engaged. Our Muslims are not voting, they're not taking part. If you want to take part, you get labelled, you get scrutinised for being a Muslim. You get scrutinised for wearing a hijab. You get scrutinised for praying. You get scrutinised for believing in your God, in your book. What's the matter with this world? What happened to plurality? What happened to democracy? What happened to freedom? What happened to our rights? What happened to us together as people? I am sick and tired to see the changes that are happening right in front of us, right under our nose, and we need to do something about it, ladies and gentlemen. So, Islamophobia, I call them rotten. Fascism, I call it rotten. Racism is criminal. And the only way we can defeat them, ladies and gentlemen, is by coming together and uniting against them. Don't label me as an extremist. Don't call my religion anything but a peaceful one. Don't call us as a united people anything but people. Racism is rotten. Islamophobia is rotten, and we must stand together against it. Thank you very much. If the Western countries, a place like the United States, had let in Jewish people, uh, there wouldn't have been six million people killed in the Holocaust, but they wouldn't let Jewish people in. That's the reality. And uh, history, unfortunately, is repeating itself unless good people to come together and, uh, and stop it repeating itself. Um, so Islamophobia is uh, the easiest way for racists to get traction in the world. This is why they're using it against uh, for, for the Labour candidate for mayor. Ifat is going to speak a little about um, what's happened to her son and the fight against uh, the racism. Thank you. I don't know how many people here are aware of Prevent. Um, it was something that the Labour government brought in after the London bombings and it's part of a counter-terrorist strategy. And since July 2015, it's become a statutory duty on schools, um, on doctors, basically anybody who works in the public sector to watch out for anybody they think might be radicalised on the route to radicalisation. Um, so hence, teachers have been put under the radar to spy on children that they're supposed to be looking after um, and um, sort of who are under their guardianship, I suppose. Um, what happened to my son was that um, he was in his class, they were discussing, they had a French, he had a French lesson, and teacher put up on the whiteboard an image of deforestation. Um, in this image, there were um, trees being chopped down, there were people trying to stop the chopping down of the trees, there was diggers, there was um, chainsaws, and they, him and his peers in the classroom were having this discussion, and he went on to talk about how the people who try to save the environment are referred to as eco-warriors, and sometimes they're referred to as eco-terrorists. Um, he didn't think nothing of it, nothing was said to him, this was on a Thursday, it was certainly raised no suspicion. He didn't come home and tell me about this conversation or discussion that they had in French. Um, on the Monday when he went into school, um, he was in a French lesson, and an adult came into the class whom he did not know and did not recognise. Uh, went to the teacher and he heard his name being mentioned, the teacher pointed to him, the adult then said, follow me. He was then led out of the classroom by this adult. He was led down a corridor, he was led down a flight of stairs, across the playground and into um, what they refer to as an inclusion centre, it was actually for excluded children. Um, then he was led to a small room where there was another lady sitting there who he did not recognise. Uh, one lady sat in front of him, one sat behind him and they basically said, well you know why you've been brought here, don't you? Um, he said no, and they said, well you were a terrorist. And he was very convinced, no I did not use the word terrorist. Um, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, oh, in the French lesson, you use the word eco-terrorist. And he said, well, I use the word eco-terrorist. I explained what that was about. And he explained it was in the, you know, relevant to the classroom discussion they were having. Um, and then she sort of said to him, oh, you're one of them tree huggers. I've got family here, tree huggers. Are you a tree hugger? Oh, are you affiliated to ISIS? <laughs> that blunt. You know, um, yeah. And um, it's like, you know, you're playing a sick psychological game with children. But, you know, was he supposed to say yes at that point because you'd made him laugh about tree hugging and, you know, he was going to suddenly open up and say, yeah, actually, I am. I um, 
but he was absolutely petrified at that point. I know he doesn't like me saying that because he wants to be a tough teenage boy, but he was absolutely petrified and um, he was worried that he was going to be taken away. He was worried that if he said anything, it was going to be misconstrued. He was then told just to wait outside the room. He was left there about 10, 15 minutes, um, not knowing what to do. And then the school bell rang and um, he decided to go to his next lesson. No one came up to him to find out if he was okay. No one rang me. No one rang his dad. He came about five o'clock that evening because he had a school club. And he did look scared. I thought maybe something had happened on the street or something. You know, and I said, well, you're all right. He said, oh, I've got something to tell you. And, this is, and then he told me he was asked at school if he was affiliated to ISIS. Um, at which point I rang the school and then they said, they kind of said, oh, nothing to worry about. Um, it was just a big misunderstanding, everything's fine. And then I sort of said, actually, have you just interviewed my son and did prevent? And then she said, yes, we have to, it's government um, rulings that all schools have to do it. Um, so that was the end of that conversation. But I was just absolutely horrified and shocked. And then I was worried that is it going to affect his chances of um, education in the future, college, university, places, employment. I mean, who's going to have this information? The teacher was reassuring me that everything's fine. But it's, it can't be fine if your 14-year-old child is just being interrogated. Our children are being targeted. Our children are being criminalised. And I know schools have always been racist, because if you look at the statistics of how they always treated black boys, you know, in Hackney, you know, for example, black boys are the highest excluded group in that region for so many years and only recently a few weeks back there was an article that came out that contrary to the sort of mainstream media hype about white boys being left behind it's still black boys that are majority excluded. Um, I want to sort of say something which is, might deem a bit controversial because everybody's been praising Sadiq Khan. So I'm assuming that we're in a safe, I'm in a safe space. Um, I don't have much sympathy for Sadiq Khan. I haven't heard him speak up against Prevent. I haven't heard him speak up to defend our Muslim children being interrogated. I haven't heard him speak up about children being criminalised. He is in a position of power. He is a male, and, you know, and he has people like Ajaman Musri and MP here who support him, who can speak up for him. My children, other Muslim children, don't have that. We don't have that. The women that are being attacked and are having their hijabs pulled off do not have that. So I expect him, yes, he's a Muslim and he wants the Muslim vote, but I expect him to earn that vote. Yes, did a uh, meeting like this in Ballon. He was never to be seen. Mm -hmm. But two days later, on Twitter, there he is, posing with Vanessa Redgrave about refugees welcome. Well, why aren't you there in the meeting in your own constituency supporting mm -hmm. refugees? Um, so I'm sorry, I have to say that because I couldn't stomach sitting here. <laughs> Not um, It's just shocking. It's shocking that they can keep bringing these laws and asking teachers to spy on people. It's shocking that they're asking GPs to spy on people. It's shocking the cuts that they're doing for um, people who are on disability benefits. It's shocking, you know, they have a new housing bill. Um, recently, the advocacy bill, that hasn't had much publicity. The charities are no longer allowed to speak about the people that they serve. You know, so everything all about prevent is, yes, it's targeting Muslim communities, and unless we get the support to challenge that, soon it's going to be targeting other groups. You know, and it's about not staying silent and coming together and uniting and speaking up. Um, Ajman, you said you've got 30,000 Facebook followers. I hope to see them on that March on the 19th. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to ask you, where the hell is your congregation? Sorry, I should use the word hell. But where is your congregation? Where is your congregation? So make sure you tell them tomorrow. <laughs> I'm actually I'm from Mosul, the north of Iraq. Uh, I have run away from ISIS. Uh, I have uh, an appointment with the Home Office, but uh, they refused my claim. And they said to me, I need to go back to Iraq. Uh, if, if I have choice to go back, I will do. But uh, now Mosul is a very dangerous city. and. Uh, I, I don't have another city, can I be there? Because uh, Iraq, they have uh, three parts of uh, people, uh, Kurdish and uh, Arab, uh, Sunni and Shia. Also the Christian people, they don't have a good chance there. Uh, just I will explain about uh, more things about uh, Calais. It's a very <laughs> disgusting place. Uh, 
if somebody asked me to try again to cross up from there, I'll never do it. I must be uh, uh, lucky because I'm not cross up by sea to Europe and uh, uh, I have been in the lorry uh, to cross up uh, when I'm arrived to Calais and I have to change my lorry again. <laughs> For me, I lost my friends, I lost my life, I lost my education. Uh, now I'm starting from nothing. I'm not looking for a good life, uh, just looking for safety place and to get to start my education uh, uh, again. <laughs> That's it. Thank you for your listening. recent polls show that uh, less than 10% of the population uh, think that uh, George Osborne cutting, doing more cuts is a good idea. In other words, 90% think it's a bad idea. But they don't want people to think about that. Instead, they want to direct people's anger about the cuts and about the problems in Britain on people that have nothing at all to do with it. And I think that's the backstory to what's going on uh, with refugees. But with uh, no uh, further ado, uh, over to Gary Young. I know lots of people are coming to here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I not long came back from the States. And while I was there, I was in Iowa and I went to some Donald Trump rallies. And uh, when people kind of say that my job is really like, lucky you, you know. And I, I say, well, I do these things so that you won't have to. And I got some, some badges. I, there's, Trump for President 2016. There was also this one, which I quite like, We Shall Overcome. Um, uh, Donald, Donald Trump. And they were a mixture of things that I thought um, either made me laugh or that made me aware that this was no laughing matter. This man could be president, um, and he's ridiculous. Um, when you stand in line, they sell hats that say, Make America Great Again. They're made in China. <laughs> um, and then there are other badges. Bomb the shit out of ISIS is, is one. Which is actually pretty much a direct quote from Donald Trump. And so if you're looking for you know, his foreign policy, as much as one would exist, that would be it. And I mean, they're very intriguing events. and Because uh, I want to talk about, first of all, what is very American about Donald Trump? Because some of it is very American, and people like to use that in order to dismiss him and say, oh my God, those Americans. And that would be a mistake. Mm -hmm. But it is right, you know, so he comes out, it's incredibly camp. He comes out, um, usually from behind a, a curtain, and just <laughs> like that. And he's, he's orange. <laughs> and when, if, if he became president, he would be the second non-white president of America. <laughs> I thought he could, he, could, he could run under the banner, Orange is the New Black. <laughs> he, he is... And then he just talks. He bloviates. He just talks. He's like the drunk uncle that you're trying to avoid. I'm going to build a big wall. It's going to be a beautiful big wall. You're going to love my wall. And the Mexicans are going to pay for it. And people cheer. And uh, the fact that there's a net outflow of Mexicans from America into Mexico, so the only thing this war would do is keep people in, it becomes irrelevant. That none of the actual factual things about what he's saying matter. That he is a performer. And so the question then becomes well, why? Do people like this performance? And in some ways, you know, there's nothing really that new about Donald Trump. He's that part of the Republican Party that has always been there in American politics. Actually, it used to be part of the Democratic Party that would be leveraged come election day, whether it was a Willie Horton ads or um, Ronald Reagan talking about welfare queens. They used to have what's called a dog whistle. Here's a quote from Nixon, who told his chief of staff, you have to face the fact that the whole problem is really the blacks. And the key is to devise a system that recognizes that while not appearing to. Now that was the entire strategy of 
the Republican Party since the Civil War era. And so they have these, what they call dog whistles, these ways of talking about race and evoking racism without actually crossing the line. And so what you have by this stage with Donald Trump is that they just got rid of the dog whistle. They've just got a straight up whistle. And he can say whatever he likes. He can say Muslims will no longer be allowed in the country. He can say um, uh, Mexicans are rapists. He can insult anybody and everybody, and he does. The disabled, uh, women, uh, the Chinese. I mean, there's almost nobody left for him uh, not to win some. And when you speak to his supporters, and there's both great heart to be taken uh, from what I'm about to say and great worry, because his supporters, you expect, I, I sent some selfies, the first one I went to, I sent some selfies of me, like, you know, with the Trump people, and I, I sent some pictures of the badges, you know, bomb the shit out of ISIS. And people were coming back on my Facebook page, I put them on my Facebook page, and they were saying, you know, be careful, and, you know, just, just watch yourself. And what they couldn't see, what they couldn't realize was how ordinary the people were. That somehow there's this expectation that if you went back to the 30s, to Nazi Germany, that people would be goose-stepping all around the place, and it would be somehow obvious. And it wouldn't have been. That they would have been very ordinary people who bought a lie. And who bought a lie because for some reason it was easier than the truth for them. So they thought. And so these are very ordinary people. And the heartening thing about that is that it's the same ordinary people, not extraordinary people. It doesn't You don't have to be Martin Luther King or Malcolm May. You don't have to be the kind of people that we've necessarily heard of. Can actually turn this back. That it doesn't take, it's about good people no longer remaining silent. It's about each person standing up where they are, on the bus, in your workplace, at the school gate, wherever it is, and facing the hate down that that's what does it. So these very um, uh, ordinary people who feel themselves in a tight spot and don't know what to do. America is in this place at the moment. There's been, in a way, nothing much has changed. Donald Trump is really leveraging the same kind of racism that Nixon leveraged and Reagan and George Bush Jr. and Sr. Black Lives Matter is galvanizing African Americans to protest state violence against black communities. But it's not that black, more black people are being killed. It's that America is now taking notice that it's a distinction they say when you're in journalism school, there's a difference between man, man bites dog, that's a story. Dog bites man, that's not a story. That happens all the time. But sooner or later, journalists have to ask themselves, well, why do these dogs keep buying people? Who owns these dogs and why do they keep buying the same people? And that's really what's happened in America, that suddenly the media class, the political class, have been forced to reckon with the daily reality of what it's like to be an African-American uh, uh, African -American person, particularly an African-American youth, which is that you live in a state of terror. You live believing that you might be killed. I've just finished a book which is about all of the kids. It doesn't come out until November. You're not allowed. They don't like bringing out books during the election year because nobody talks any sense during the election year, so there's nothing that you can do with the book. You actually have to wait for the election to go before you can have a political conversation, which um, says something about the election to it. Um, so it's coming out in November. It's about all, it's called A Day in the Death of America. It's about all of the kids and teens who were shot dead in one day in America. Every day, seven kids are shot dead in America. I picked a day at random. There were ten kids who were shot dead uh, on that day. And uh, there were seven, seven were black, two Latino, one white. And every single black parent, when I asked them, did you think that this could happen to your son? They're all boys. To a person, they looked at me like I was kind of, and they said, of, of course. Yeah, of course. One of the mothers said, well, I didn't think it would be him. I thought it would be his older brother. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, 
working class African Americans are trying to get their kids to 18 without being in prison or dead. And that's uh, the notion of what successful parenting is, given the confines that you're living in. And Black Lives Matter has drawn attention to that. But it's not that that reality has changed. On the other hand, you have Trump um, uh, doing what he's doing. And that's what's really very American about it. But here's what's not very American about it. It's that Trump is appealing to a section of the white working class who have seen their wages stagnate for a generation, who are struggling with job insecurity, uh, whose um, um, life expectancy is falling. Working class white Americans, their life expectancy um, is falling. They've just had almost a generation of wealth wiped out since the economic crash. And they're looking for someone to blame. <laughs> and if you understand Trump in that context, then he's not that different to Marine Le Pen, <laughs> the True Finns, Victor Orban, Stuart Wilders. Each one is particularly Dutch or Finnish or French in their own way, but each one is galvanizing a very, very similar uh, uh, constituency in a very <coughs> similar way. And the root of these concerns, I think, is the neoliberal system in which we live, which operates according to the golden rule. And that's that those who make the gold make the rules. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so in a system like that, where you can move, they keep worrying about people moving. I remember I studied Russian, French and Russian, so I studied at university. And I remember before the wall came down, they, one of the things they used to say that was so terrible about the Soviet Union, and I thought this was terrible about the Soviet Union, was that they didn't allow people to travel. That people could not of their own free will just, just leave. And then as soon as the wall came down, they put up another wall and they said, well, you can't come in here. I mean, obviously, we think it's a good thing that you're traveling, but you ain't traveling here. <laughs> well, politics kept them in and economics kept them out. I believe in the free movement of people. Yeah. And I find it morally, I don't find it absurd. I understand the reason behind it, but I find it m morally bankrupt that we live in a world where machines and money can move easier than people. That nobody's stopping a machine or money or any of the things, uh, you know, software, hardware, and saying, are you going to put somebody at work? Because if you're going to put somebody at work, you can't come in. But as soon as a human being shows up, then suddenly they are uh, being interrogated. Now, you know, I don't assume that open borders anything that's going to happen soon. But I actually personally believe that it's a very important principle that human beings have the right to move around the world. This is our world. It's not money's world. It's not a world. Flags are something that we invented. We invented flags. We invented countries. But we are people. We drew these boundaries. We made these laws. We can unmake them. So, when you live in this world where, at the press of a button, you can move your capital to somewhere where labor is cheaper and unions are weaker and regulations are slacker, then people move too. You actually don't leave them with an awful lot of choice. Also, if you are polluting the world in the way that we are, then people have to move because you're destroying their environment. And finally, and kind of most obviously when we have a speaker from Mosul here, we're talking about Syri Syrian refugees and so on. If you were going to bomb huge parts of the world and force people to move because they cannot live, then what right do you have to say that you can't come here? They're coming here.
And so, to a large extent, this refugee crisis, I believe that everybody should be able to move wherever they want, wherever they want, whenever they want. But actually, large numbers of these people would not have wanted to move if they could have stayed. And they are actually refugees from our politics, our war, our pollution. And so this is very much a problem that we have made. So when, when there is this sense of kind of like, well, you know, we can't, we can't take in all the world's misery, we'll stop creating the misery, and then you won't have to understand it as taking in um, the world's misery. But I think if we start from an understanding of neoliberal uh, neo globalisation, and, and particularly what's happened over the past eight years, then it becomes possible to reframe the discussion, because an awful lot of what is at the root of these concerns, concerns that fuel and um, nurture racism, are legitimate concerns. Not all of them, but a lot of them. That for some people, the fact that we live in a more cosmopolitan world and that means we can get lots of different kinds of cheese and different kinds of you know, coffee and, and uh, might be fantastic. But for other people, they're scared. They're scared about their livelihoods. And they see a whole load of stuff happening that they don't understand, that they have no control over, and they look for someone to blame. Now, neoliberal globalization is a force without a face, it's a system without a center, and so unless there is an argument, a counter-argument, then the notion, look, gypsies, the Roma, Muslims, refugees, Syrians, the enemy of the month club, unless we come up with a counter-argument, then those are much more easily identifiable targets than abstract conversations about the banking system. But I think we can say, look, these Syrian refugees, they did not close your library. Yeah. They didn't trade in credit default swaps. They are not the reason why we are in the situation that, that we are in. Actually, if we had been able to stop our government participating in that war, then maybe there wouldn't be the kind of ISIS that would be trashing Syria right now. That this is as much to do as it is to do with that. And I think that's an argument that can be made, and I think it's an argument that can be won. I was hardened when I arrived back in August um, from the States, not long after um, Alan Kirby, um, all of the publicity around Alan Kirby. And I'd seen, when I was in the States, I think, Katie Hopkins talking about cockroaches. Oh. And this, to me, it was like Kafka's metamorphosis in reverse, that here you had the so-called insect turned back into a human being. So suddenly we were talking about a child. And it saddened me because I thought, Jesus, this is what it took. This is what it took. It took people to see a three, four-year-old child face down in the surf, dead, for them to understand that these were people, for them to understand that nobody makes those journeys rickety boats, across deserts, with bandits risking life, and then people don't make those journeys in order to pick up benefits in England. It's not like the benefit system is so great, and there's some <laughs> fantastic kind of, you know, um, Facebook page that's like, look, if you really want to, you know, if you really want to get 20 quid a week, this is what you have to do. <laughs> it's going to be golden, I promise you. But there was something that came out of that. And it was something that I didn't know existed. I hadn't been here. And that was this constituency that had effectively been orphaned of people supporting refugees, of this, just this outpouring that happened. Not the obviously hypocritical, opportunistic thing where the newspapers suddenly you know, thought this was something they should worry about. But Actually, people saying, you know what, I'm going to take my, I've got to do something. I'm going to take my van and I'm going to take this stuff down to Calais. I'm uh, um, going to collect all this stuff and I'm going to take it over to this charity centre. These were people I honestly 
obviously, I, you know, I'm a socialist, so I live in hope. It kills me. But I, I, um, so I knew that there were people who cared about refugees. Of course I did. But I didn't know it was such a big constituency. I didn't know it was so active. And in the absence of any political champion, which you didn't have at the time, this was before Jeremy was elected, and actually it really moved me that the first thing he did after he was elected was go to this demonstration. I was like, well, we've never seen that before. <laughs> and that was already, in a sense, I was like, I don't kind of care what happens now, actually. Like, I've seen enough. Like, this is a new kind of, this, th this is already new. And this is already good, because it is forcing a reckoning with what has not been said. It's forcing a reckoning um, with our silence. And so the, the way in which those um, people galvanize themselves and organize themselves and uh, made that possible uh, was very heartening to me because I thought, okay, so there is more, obviously there's always more going on than I know about, but I think we surprised each other. Because people, I think, more obviously than we had realized, had been shouting at the television alone, or weeping alone, or somehow suffering internally um, alone. And what it said to me was that we are better, all present company accepted. We are better than our politicians. And we are better than our politics that the things that we see reflected in the media, the things that we think of as being our politics, doesn't always include us, but that doesn't mean that we are not involved in politics, that we're better than that. As a country, we are better than that. And as human beings, we are better than that. And that's why it's so important, come March the 19th, that we have huge crowds, because they matter. Because they give other people hope. They give refugees hope. They give the people making those journeys, Macedonia and Serbia, they give them hope. But we give each other hope too. That when we stand up to racism, we're also standing up for each other. Thank you. completely unfair and I want to thank Gary for speaking. I want to thank the panel for, um, for what they've said. Catherine, you know, a, a mother that stood up and said what's going wrong. I think all these things have to be said but I wanted to read this thing to you because this is, um, this is the Daily Telegraph, right? And it said, on the 8th of August, it said, um, Calais activists are having a march against the main camp for Britain to open its borders. And it said 300 well-heeled social activists and communist groups from London, one man from Tottenham led chants against David Cameron telling him to go to hell. And this, uh, this journalist, that was me by the way. This journalist turned around and said there'd be nobody to support you. He spent his whole time laughing all the way through. He goes, no one cares in, in London. When I get back, oh, I've got to get this copy in. Get one as quickly as possible. And I told him at the time, I said, you're waking up a sleeping giant. Because you think that it's all right. When David Cameron turns around and says, you know, they're just, you know, when Jeremy Corbyn went to the camp, I think Jeremy Corbyn and Diane, Ab Diane Abbott should be congratulated for going to the camp. And when he turned around and said a bunch of migrants, they're just a bunch of migrants, what was he really saying? The truth is a bunch of migrants helped to build this country, to be honest. There's a bunch of Irish, Jewish, people from all over the world helped to build this country. He was trying to denigrate, he was trying to divide and rule. Every time you've heard him speak from the beginning of the year, Gary's right. When the results came in this year, when Osborne's results came in, you saw exactly what he said. He suddenly said there's a problem with Muslims marching. There's a problem that there's a Muslim women can't speak English suddenly. Because the results came in and they were bad. Right? So you had to look for, it was almost as crude as that. And you know, the idea that this man talks about a segregated society, I have to say that Zach, George, 
and and um, and David all went to the same school. And this school is the most segregated school in the country. It's segregated by class, it's segregated by money, and it's segregated by gender. It's called Eton. And they all come from the same school and they have the right to tell us how to live and how we should live. It's a disgrace. And we have to fight for a different type of society. And to be honest, I'm actually... There's two, I'm horrified and scared. I never thought, I, I, I never understood the Holocaust, to be honest. I never really understood it. I, I go to Auschwitz, I never just, I just couldn't understand how it happened. I really couldn't understand. But I tell you, one visit to the camp inside Calais, and I did. Because if you can stand by watching children sit by a sewer, and then blame them. Actually, if you can send bulldozers into them, and then say, I'm dispersing you. And the other question is, where? Because, you know, normally, Gary ga ga put it well, if you cover deserts, seas and survive, whatever it is, normally your name is called Beer Grills, isn't it? Yeah? And you, you, they make a program about you surviving, oh, that was tough. Yeah? People are actually living like that in order to survive, and actually we have to make some kind of difference now to, to what they're doing. The march on the 19th is a march for everybody. You see, there are, there are people on the streets that are disaffected and are being treated as a minority. They're called doctors and nurses, actually. And they're being, it's done by Hunt in that way, and he's doing it because he wants to get rid of the NHS. Suddenly they said their migrants are using the NHS. No, no, you use private medicine. We use the NHS, right? We need the NHS to keep ourselves alive. Now, I, I think this is a straight case of divide and rule. And the reason why we have to march against March of Refugees, I, I agree, there's a nasty whiff across Europe. You see, when you see Le Pen in Calais winning those kind of votes that she's winning, actually it's opening those doors to the same things that led to the Holocaust. Mm. But I have to, it, all, at the same time, I have to say that I remember the march on the 12th of September. I remember putting it out. People, people put it out, 20,000 people signed up, people all came together, and people took to the streets. There's a mood for change. There are people that want to change what's going on, and I think we have to fight to save those people's lives. We have to make sure that, um, I was on the radio <coughs> today and they said that in Cambridge there was a pro, there's a, they were doing a question about what was, what can we do practically in each area? And they showed the figures of the amount of refugees that have been taken. You see, what the councils came to do, they haven't even allowed, the government hasn't even allowed, you know the poultry 5,000 that they said they were going to do? They haven't even done that. When, you saw David Cameron, didn't you, fly off to a camp? And he sat down there looking awkward. Did you notice that? <laughs> Hello, poor refugee type people. I really care. Right? And you just knew the guy was lying. And it's the same kind of thing that they're doing to them, to us as well. But I think we can begin to break this. Haringey is a reflection of that. I've just come from a mosque in Tower Hamlets. And other the mosque, they said they beat the EDL four times when they came down there and they pushed them out. And the truth, that didn't come from people telling them how to do it. It came from people collectively um, coming together. There's a tradition of resistance around here. I know I'm not allowed to mention it, but I remember Bernie Grant sitting on this very platform, actually, and turning around and saying it was right for people, if they were pushed around, to say they had a right to defend themselves. And it is, you know, there is a problem. The question, how is it? I, I met Imran Khan last week in Rotherham. And how is it suddenly, the police were designed, they were told that they were institutionally racist, yeah? That's the truth of it. I don't think they've completely got over that. And suddenly we're told that these are the people we've got to put the trust in, in order to put in prevent. Now I think this is very dangerous times, but I also think there are times where we have to turn around and resist. And I'll end up on this. Every generation faces a test, actually, I think. Something happens in their society, and people say, what did you do? I remember, it's like, it's like that horrible picture. I don't know if you've seen, you know David Cameron suddenly saying he cared about Nelson Mandela. Oh, he cared. He used to wear a T-shirt saying, hang Nelson Mandela. And suddenly he says, yeah, I'm part of this tradition, and it has a selfie taken at the funeral. What we have to turn around, we have to begin to, I think there's a, there's a feeling where people want to make sure they can save people. The only way we're going to be able to save people is if we mobilise. We have to make it possible that our voices are heard and that we're not isolated. <coughs> this is something we can do when we march on the 19th and bring those people together. I think part of marching on the 19th is also to remember when people, so we make the link between racism and austerity. Because mm. so I think the two things are linked together. We also have to march against austerity and also after we have to march against racism. We have to pull them together. 
when we do that, I think we can, we can we make a difference. And I'll end up on this final point. The march isn't just taking place inside the UK. It's also taking place inside Athens. And it's a warning to us what's happening inside Athens. Look what they did to the Greek people when they said they weren't going to allow them in terms of cutting their living standards. There's no money, you can't have it. And then suddenly they turn around and say that it's all right to open up what I call concentration camps. And by the way, we'll pay off some of the debt if you do that. It's the most disgraceful and disgusting thing I've seen. It's an attempt to divide people on the basis on the way that they've organized. Who's gonna benefit from that? I tell you who benefit from that, Golden Dawn. They're the people that will benefit from that. But I'm fa I think it's fantastic in Athens, inside Poland, inside Barcelona, or when we march, we're marching with them, and in Scotland. And when we march, everybody will be marching together to say we want a different type of Europe, not based on racism and division, but one which fights Islamophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, <coughs> homophobia, all the divisions, and we come out onto the streets and we get, we get reflected in that. But the only way that's going to work is if everybody in here brings another five or ten people because numbers count. It matters what we do. They think it doesn't matter what we do, but it does matter. I just, I want to end up on another thing. When I went to Rotherham, the women there said they wanted to march at the front to say that they're not submissive. Do you mean that they're marching with us and stuff like that? I mean, anybody who thinks they're Muslim women are submissive, <laughs> <laughs> we should take that. We should, we should take that. We should traditionally submissive. We should take that and send that, yeah. send that to, send that to Dave, David Cameron. But we've got a chance, I think, to make. A, we've got a window to make a big difference in order to save people's lives, mm. but also to change our lives and begin to push back what the Tories are trying to do, and in the shape of that, talk about an alternative type of way that we should live. I I'll end up on that, and thank everybody. Thank you very much.